Good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to see you all. And uh, I was happy to hear that most of you in this group are working on the Manipura Chakra in Chinese, the Tantian. This is the navel point. And having said that, I would like you to place Zen Buddhism in your mind more or less to the right area. For most of you, this may look like a Japanese or Korean or Chinese product of more than 2,000 years of spiritual evolution. However, even in the Buddha's time, that means Shakyamuni Siddhartha, uh, it was present 2,500 years ago. At that time, it was called Jhana. By now, you probably know that yoga can have many, many purposes, both inside of you and outside of you in the world and within yourself. But the Jhana school had one and only one purpose, awakening, in Sanskrit, moksha. So there are 10,000 ways to achieve that, but the Jhana school believed that if you do meditation and you turn your energy inside, then sooner or later your mind will find the path to awakening. And suddenly we jump 28 generations, a thousand years after the Buddha, to a person called Bodhidharma. He had a teacher called Prajnatara, who was a very high-class yogi. And he said to his student, Bodhidharma, when you are ready, you take the Dharma to China. It is only comparable to the advent or the oncoming of oriental teachings to the West in the 20th century. In China, Jhana was pronounced as Channa. Then they later on chopped off the end and Chan remained. And the same Chinese character is pronounced as Son in Korea and Zen in Japan. However, the meaning never changed. It still means awakening by turning your energy inwards and find your mind's path to enlightenment. And obviously, since we have a body, we have to work with the body and the mind at the same time. In China, the Dharma from India met Taoism. So the Indian techniques and the Chinese techniques were combined and merged throughout centuries. In yoga, you know you work with all the seven chakras, and some systems use more or less, but the seven is a given, it's the basics. In Taoism, they know all these, but they work with only three the lower burner, which is the Manipura Chakra in Chinese Tantian, the middle burner, which is your solar plexus up here, and the heart, the upper burner. If our body and mind are not balanced, then they say the cauldron, the pot, is turned upside down. Then the fire is too high up and water is down below. That's out of balance. When everything is in balance, then fire is below, the cauldron is the right side up and water is above. And then you have nice heat and good steam. And that's why in Taoism they put a lot of emphasis on the Tantian. But Zen practitioners noticed a lot more about this chakra. First of all, in the upper parts of the body you notice many differentiations. Here you have emotions, in the throat you have speech, here you have thinking. But the Tantian is a very special point where your body and mind are in an undifferentiated state. We call that one mind. At this point there is pure electricity, just energy by itself. When it comes up it becomes a microwave oven, an iPad, a television screen, so it becomes functional in these upper centers. Moreover, Practitioners also notice that the biggest energy connection between you and the universe is through this gateway. But we also notice that just providing energy to your person is not a solution. In fact, it's only half of the solution. The other half is information. So where you have energy, there is also information. And where you have information, there is also energy. The two are inseparable. In fact, the two are like the two sides of the same coin. We have to remember this. If your mind is not clear, then you get more energy, your karma becomes stronger. You put a lot of energy into the Tantian, you also get a lot of energy from the Tantian. We call that focus. Your willpower becomes stronger, your intuition becomes clearer, but if you don't clean the upper centers, you might be very, very surprised. So when you have more energy, more extreme behavior can appear. Sometimes bursts of anger or bursts of greed or desire, they appear like clouds in the sky. But if we are attached to our karma, our own self-image, 
our own ideas, and we don't see them as clouds, we see them as bullets hitting us. Something solid, something strong, something real. That's why we have to keep our minds clear, that is, the information correct, when we have a lot of energy in our body and mind together. One day, you are driving on Ayalon Highway, very long, straight stretch, and suddenly some idea takes you, and you do this with the steering wheel. If you go at 30 kilometers per hour, looks a little weird because your car goes like that, okay, zigzag. You do this at 90 kilometers per hour, it becomes dangerous, really dangerous. Okay. Do this at 130, you end up in the ditch in 10 seconds. So you have a lot of energy, strong karma appears. Low energy, karma manifests slower. That's why when you have a lot of energy and you have very strong practice, your direction, why you do that, how you do that, must be extremely clear not to harm yourself and others. Generally, if you take your own idea about yourself, that is your self-image, that is your imagination of your own ego, if you take that out of the picture, you give yourself a much better time. You don't make so much suffering and you don't receive so much suffering in turn. How to do that? How do we take this big hindrance of our own dualistic ideas out of the picture? In Zen we ask questions. Both inside and outside we ask questions that open up the mind or open up a situation. Secret. And this very, very important question is, what is this? So what is it that sees with my eyes, hears with my ears, acts with my body, speaks with my tongue, etc.? You direct that question inside to the right point, you keep your focus on your Tantian, and soon your mind can return to a state we call before thinking. Then you let go of all your devices up here and return to the source down there. If you do that, then you see how your mind creates everything with thinking, speech, feelings, actions. This kind of enhanced perception establishes this mirror-like mind. This mirror-like mind means your mind space becomes clear. This means you have a choice. If your mind space is clear, if your mind mirror reflects very accurately, you make better decisions. This is why we emphasize the importance of staying at the moment very clearly. You lose the moment, you lose your mind mirror. You attach to any aspects of past, present, future, you lose this moment, you lose this space, you lose this mirror. You attach to any ideas up in the mind or in the heart, anything dualistic, you break your world into many pieces. Originally, this world has no problem. We make them, all of them. For us, for ourselves, for the animals, for the entire planet, we make them. So how do we stop doing that? We return to this point in the Manipura Chakra, which is not moving body, not moving mind. In Chinese, it's called Wu Wei, okay? It's not laziness, it's just not moving, it's different. Then your mind becomes clear, then you have a choice. And when you live your life with this kind of clarity, it's called the function of this don't know or not moving mind. In Chinese, Wei Wu Wei, acting non-action. So, first question over there. First of all, uh, I'm very um, agree with what you said. I, I, I noticed in, uh, in myself, but there is some uh, questions and problem uh, with th this kind of thing, uh, thinking, because uh, Evolutionic. Why do we have ego? Evolutionic. We need. We need to fight. Even some uh, someone who got to to an uh, enlightenment, he still needs to fight the ego all the time and to see that he is not carry with the ego even uh, after he, he had been uh, enlightenment. So, uh, according to the Zen, why we uh, in the first start we we have an ego? Is there is something good in the ego. Okay. I know in business you, you have to have an uh, ego. Oh, <laughs> we, be careful with that. Okay. So in your question, there's a bad guy. The ego is the bad guy, huh? Um, not the bad guy, but it's, it's a disturb us. Work with me. Okay. But this bad guy has two friends in your question. One is enlightenment and the other is evolution. That's a gang. It's very strong. It's dangerous. So first we have to apprehend them. What is evolution? 
I mean, no, I'm not asking you because this is going to take forever. <laughs> it's a poetical question for the whole audience. What is evolution? Evolution is an idea, okay? It yeah. doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but the way evolution works has many, many holes in it, okay? Many unknown factors and unknown passages of time. So we have our own idea of evolution, but if you look deep inside, we actually don't know what it is and how it works. So we can take this guy to custody. The other guy, enlightenment, is pretty hard to define. It's not like evolution. Evolution should be something scientific. Enlightenment is something really spiritual and very, very hard to put into words, okay? So I believe we should let this guy go. No custody, no charges, let it go. This has several advantages. You don't have an idea of something that is really, really impossible to put into words. You can only experience it. You can't read it. You can't make it happen. You can't ingest it, drink it. So how do you define something which is only an experience? Almost impossible. So you take away the idea of enlightenment. Then you can work with yourself better. So then you look inside. There is no better you or worse you. There is no enlightened me or egotistical me. You take these ideas away, you don't go back to the past to fix the evolutionary problem, then you're left with one problem, yourself. <laughs> Very convenient. Now the next thing is how to approach this one, the ego problem. The why question is not productive because your rational mind makes up a lot of explanations. These explanations become like cycles, circles, and they always return to themselves. So you see that these explanations are like infinite. Infinite. There is no beginning and end to them, except when you tell yourself inside, shut up, enough thinking, done. Okay? That's when it's over. By itself, it's never over. Instead of why, ask a better question. It begins with what. So what is the source of this notion of ego? Where does this come from? Then you see, if you direct this question really deep inside, you see a lot of thoughts, a lot of emotions, a lot of ideas fused together with your sense of identity. And that's all there is to it. There is no single core. There is no single problem. It's a whole network of relationships, karma, dualistic ideas, with your seal of me on it. That's all. We have many functions of our consciousness. One is distinguishing. In this distinguishing mind, we have many other functions. Some of them are okay, some of them are a little bit burdensome. You need to learn the name of this for your own studies. It's called manas in Sanskrit. Good food, bad food. Poison and nourishment. You have to distinguish between that. But if the same function goes into overdrive, you become a very judgmental person. Somebody really hard to deal with. And it's the same consciousness. But one function is correct, the other function is incorrect. With the notion of self, is the same thing. It's born in the manas, to distinguish yourself and the world. We need this for survival. If we don't have this, we cannot survive on this planet. You have to have a sense of self and use your own shoes, not somebody else's shoes. It's necessary. Or you recognize, it's my mistake, I'm sorry. Not somebody else's mistake, I don't blame them. My mistake. But the moment you say, I am better than every one of us, this kind of self appears, the self becomes a huge problem. That's why you have to perceive, using this question, what is this? Where does this come from? How your notion of ego is formed? How your notion of self appears? How it functions? And then you can direct that to the correct direction. You can help yourself and others with it. But the same thing can become an immeasurable burden, a huge amount of suffering just because we left it unexplored. We didn't see this clearly. We don't know how it works. Then it's our problem. So put this question into your Tantian. Put this question into your Manipura Chakra. Don't let this question fight with your thinking or fight with your emotions. That is not necessary. And don't attach to anything which appears, because if you don't attach to it, it will also disappear. Remember what I said to you about this clear like space, clear like mirror mind. This does not appear or disappear, okay? So you're not, not losing anything during meditation, only your illusions, only your dualistic ideas, only your false self-image. And that's when you retrained the gangster into a social worker. 
there's a, you know, there's a connection. Or someone with substance abuse problem into a therapist. The harder you try to get rid of your notion of self or your ego image, the stronger it becomes. It's the way dualistic mind works. So don't fight your notion of self, but don't just accept it as it is. And, okay, I cannot do anything. This is who I am. That's also wrong. Don't predetermine your path. A path is something for you to discover, something you walk out of your own effort. And if you ask the question and keep the question, you get started on the path and you can continue. At one point on this path, there will be a moment where there is no self. There has to be. And if you practice correctly, that moment comes. That's the experience no one can give you. Only you can lead yourself there. That's the moment when transformation becomes 100% possible. Without this moment of awakening or non-self or non-duality, transformation remains tied and bound by your leftover karma. That's why we need to practice. That's the only reason. Otherwise, it's a museum, you know? This museum, this museum, museum. But all these traditions have a very important function to lead you to that moment of experience when you and this world completely become one and your notion of self disappears. That's when you wake up and define your own spiritual evolution. So the friends of the former gangster come back and help him do a good job. Now, we have a very patient gentleman in the back row waiting for his turn. So please pass the mic. First of all, thank you for coming. The question is divided into two. One, can you expand on the uh, issue of anger management? And the other half of the question is, uh, sometimes we see um, uh, a s something uh, social which makes us anger, angry, uh, rightfully so. How do you deal with this anger that arises in you um, uh, when you see something that you should be angry about? And what do you do about that? You ask two questions. Two questions are more expensive. <laughs> One is more compact. It's not so expensive. Self-righteousness and anger are very bad company. They lead you to very, very bad places. Approach from another direction. Violence <coughs> is the last refuge of the incompetent. I didn't say that. Isaac Asimov said that. So look at that. Anger is the outburst of uncontrolled energy because you couldn't see correct use of it. So it, boom, becomes a nuclear bomb instead of staying as a nuclear power plant. Same uranium, two different functions. There's one question which totally takes away anger. How can I help? You follow this question, then the correct way of manifesting your energy appears, and it doesn't become anger or violence. When this way is not there, we are incompetent. So violence appears. So we have first some strong attachment comes from usually self-righteousness. I am the father. I have to tell you this. I am the boss. I have to tell you this. I'm the president. I have the right to declare war. Ah, terrible. <laughs> All comes from this notion of I, the self-righteous ego who always knows better. That's the problem. So when you notice inside your attachment to this idea that I know better, then you reflect on this anger. So attachment anger becomes reflected anger. Then you see, oh my God, what have I done? What have I said? This kind of stuff. It's called reflected anger. There are many ways to destroy a house. One is with a bulldozer and the other is your emotions. But the ruins are there. When a family has a night of anger, it takes days to fix it. Sometimes weeks. And some wounds don't heal. Because we keep going back there. We keep going good and bad about it, right or wrong about it. So the wounds don't heal because you always tear up the scar. So after a while, there, there is some surrender. Say, I cannot do anything about it. This is, it's too big. It's too much. I can't. I need help. I need somebody to share this with. I need a path to get rid of this. That's when your practice begins. So then you get to the third phase, which is called no anger. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes energy. But then you can get there. You're not alone with this. There are many friends on the path who have the same kind of problem. In fact, there is no human being without anger and desire. 
these things, these minds, they keep our self together from the very beginning. And it takes a lot of energy to transcend that. You can, but the basic karma of humanity on this earth has been so much focused about these two dualities, anger and desire, that by default we take them for granted. We take them as they have to exist. But the message of any correct spiritual path is that they do not have to exist. We make them. And if we don't make them, they're not there. So when you reach this point of no anger, same as the point of non-self, then you can transform. And the next phase is what we call transformed anger. That's when we stop being incompetent and use our energy in a different way. So instead of being angry, we do something which actually changes the situation and the condition correctly. One dramatic and really tragic thing about human life is that you build a relationship for 20 years and in 20 seconds you can destroy it. If your mind is clear, if you have your mind space expanded, if your mind mirror functions and reflects, you have a choice. You have a choice to act or not act, to use your emotions or let them go, okay? If you don't have that mind space, no matter how much you think, it will not help. So return to your Manipura Chakra. In fact, that's the place where the lotus opens. That's why I call it Manipura Chakra. The lotus opens here. Clear breathing practice here. Mental and physical focus here. Maybe many hours a day, but at least some in the morning, some in the evening. You don't practice, you don't have it. You practice, you have it. Very simple. More questions? I've been uh, familiar with Zen Buddhism and Buddhism at all from uh, the age of 10. Wow, you're way ahead of me. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 17 now. Um, Mazal tov. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> My father introduced me to Zen until the, at the age of uh, 14. And since then, I've been thinking and developing self-awareness. But as I kept developing it, I just kept, my suffering just kept going. I began thinking too much and I've been dragging into the wrong directions instead of developing happiness or uh, healthy awareness. Mm -hmm. So that's the question I hope to ask you, how to fix that, how to not to think so much. I have good news and bad news for you. <laughs> Which one would you like first? <laughs> so the good news is you have fantastic start. You know, I wish I had been introduced to this like when I was 10, okay? So you have a very good family karma. You were born to the right place, correct? <laughs> and there is no bad news, okay? But you have to see something. At this point in your life, you can listen to people who are sitting in this kind of chair or this kind of seat. You can also listen to your father, but these teachers cannot really help you. So, so far, no mistake. Everything that you know had to stay theoretical. Why? You don't have enough experience. You didn't live long enough for that. You know who will be your next great teacher? Your girlfriend. <laughs> Relationships are perfect teachers. And if we take that teaching to our heart, 100%, we can also be good teachers for them. So in this case, as you're growing up, open up to these experiences and te treat these relationships correctly, okay? Whoever she is or will be, she will not be interested in Zen or anything you think about Buddhism, that's for sure. <laughs> At the very beginning, you bet this is true, maybe later. To see another human being for who he or she is, is one of the greatest skills, and it's much appreciated. We call that the root of compassion. You don't see the other person in the way he or she is, there's no way to be compassionate, because you are preoccupied with your own idea of that person. It's just as bad as your own idea about yourself. Same problem. So throughout these experiences, what you learned in the father's house will come around in a different light. We call that maturity. Go on, life is right ahead of you. <laughs> I'm going back to Yaakov's question regarding the anger management. Sure. And uh, to something key that you said um, regarding if there's something that uh, gets you mad, gets you angry, 
to say, okay, how can I help? And that will switch the whole situation, which is fantastic. But the question is, <laughs> what? You are disabling the question. When you say, but, everything okay. else which happened before stops. Okay. Now, ask the question without a but. Try that. Okay. So if, if, if you look at the situation in a way of saying, okay, I'm not going to be angry. I want to see how high I can help the situation. How can you do this when you're not alone in the situation? It takes two to tango. And after a situation repeats itself again and again and again, and each time you choose to help the situation instead of get angry, there's a point where you say, enough. Super skillful, wonderful. So we so. talked about mind space. This mind space is not just your individual property. You can use this. I encourage everybody to use this. But this is exactly the space you can give to others also. We call that patience and endurance and perception. So if you give space to others, then you open up new ways to really look at that person, look at that relationship. And when you run out of juice because your center is not strong enough, you increase that space. Sometimes that means you have to step outside of the room, of the relationship, because you are at the end of the reserves that you had. It's very important to see your limits. You don't see your limits, then you get upset. Because you are kicking the car instead of fueling it and then getting back to Ayalon Highway. You really have to keep your center strong and your mind clear. That means your mind doesn't move and doesn't go into reactive habits. We have all our habits, how we react. And if we don't see them, then right now, at this moment, it can be very, very dangerous, destructive, all kinds of problems appear because we don't see our own reaction. So change the mind from reactive to proactive. If you look at anger management and how to treat people, especially in small groups, it turned out that talking is not enough. No matter how much you talk about it, you hear various reflections, they do not move really from their own mindset. The karma, we say, cannot be dislodged. Next step is creativity. That's why I say not reactive, but proactive. So you have something creative to give to the person or to the group, it changes from destructive to creative and something miraculous can happen. Same power, different direction. So if you have this question, how may I help you? Then you find the correct manifestation for this energy and everything will be in place. It's important to emphasize, correctly in place. We translate that as Correct situation, correct relationship, correct function. Next question. I'm uh, Irit and I uh, practice yoga for like 10 years. Uh, one, ha one and a half an hour a week. S and, I, and I still can't um, switch off my mind and my feelings. And I can't uh, uh, hear what Manipur is telling me to do in the situation. Uh, so how, how can I, in the um, Western world, not in the ashram, uh, can deal with the, the children that don't want to get out of their bathroom? Mm. <laughs> if there's a voice, it's yours. How clear is that voice depends on your mind. So do you have a lot of thinking? Are you attached to that thinking? Yeah. Then you have more asanas to do. In 10 years, your body must have become super flexible. How flexible is your mind? Not enough. Wonderful. <laughs> so your children teach you. Because if they get in the bathroom and they don't come out, you have to be very flexible inside to find out something that get them out of there. Okay. If you somehow motivate them that what they're looking for inside is actually outside and even better, they will soon come. <laughs> so food, drink, and their friends, they are not in the bathroom. And if they spend many hours in there with their mobile telephones, battery runs out, done. They have to come. So Perceive much. cause and effect clearly. It's a big don't worry exercise, okay? Don't worry. Perceive cause and effect, find the line which is actually motivating the kids correctly, and then you can do this. And I say this because I've seen many families in many cultures, and it always works the same way. No matter where you are, no matter what language you speak. If we perceive cause and effect, 
mentally, emotionally, physically, every possible way, there's always a solution. If there's no solution, we haven't seen something. I, I didn't understand you about the cause and reaction. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. What is it that you didn't <laughs> understand? Cause and effect means you perceive what it is that gets the child out of the bathroom. Cause and effect, it works in the mind. You say the right thing, you send the right message, you get the right response. And there are a bunch of preconditions for that. First, don't worry. Don't always want to be the mother of your child. Let them do what they want to do. They'll get fed up with it by themselves. <laughs> if you keep hitting that, they will oppose you. They will just want to prove that they are stronger, you know. Let them do it a little bit. If it's not dangerous, let them do it. They'll get tired, come out, Mommy, I'm hungry. So, it's going to happen. Next question. What can I do if I can't leave the room in the middle of a conflict? Uh, what if I get overwhelmed and the thing that irritates me or the opposing force is too much to handle and I cannot leave the situation? If your body cannot leave the room, your karma should leave the room. Keep your mind very clear. Don't say anything. Don't do anything. Don't attach to anything. Become like space. Don't give any surface for any dualistic reaction. Usually this happens, this kind of spaciousness, when we shut up and we don't talk. Your question reflects that this is an ongoing chronic problem in your life. Not one time, many times and frequently and maybe close or even within the family. The biggest problem is that within a family if the atmosphere of trust and love is gone it's terrible because suddenly there seems to be no solution. In that situation if your mind is clear enough and you don't follow your karma, you don't follow your habits, you don't follow your worries, concerns, hopes and fears, that's all your karma, then at the right moment you can say, okay, how can I help? Next big task is to keep that mind because it will be attacked from all angles. So that they would push you back to the previous role of being pushed down or fighting to the above person, whether elder brother, father, that doesn't matter. But they would want you to assume the same role which was improductive, destructive, absorbing, wasting energy, etc., etc. Because they don't know any better. You should. So then keep that mind and expand on it. You say, all right, you say this, but how can I help in a way that's good for all of us? Most of the time, the opposing party, whoever you are dealing with, intentionally blocks your feelings towards them. And your job is to make this very visible, that you are distressed, that you feel sad, that you feel hopeless, that you want a solution etc etc and when your feelings reach them together with this how can I help question it starts to change not right away not easily but that's the way to change that kind of relationship responding to anger with anger only makes war big or small doesn't matter but it makes war and in this part of the world everybody knows what that means so first don't respond to anger with anger second Attain that mind which doesn't move and doesn't respond, becomes like space, becomes like a mirror. And next, use the correct karma, the correct speech, the correct approach to be helpful and present at the same time. And that helps the other person because they are also just as weak. They just want to look big and look strong. But anger has a weak spot inside. Okay, always. At the core, there is weakness, there's fear. There's this cringing little something which wants to look like a huge animal, okay? And if you talk to that, if you talk to that very center, then anger is bypassed and some compassion appears eventually. Okay? And for that, you need to train yourself. Find a group, find a teacher, find a teaching that actually can help you do that. You cannot do this alone, like your friend, you're also not mature enough and it's not your fault. You just haven't lived that many years. That's all. More questions? The question is, should we express our feelings to people that hurt us? Should we say to them, uh, this is her question, 
should we explicitly uh, express our uh, displeasure and our feelings towards people who hurt us? How in well, words or in other uh, methods. How well do you see this person right in front of you? That's for you to, de to determine. And if you see that person, then you can also perceive, is that person listening? Many times we say, it's like talking to a wall. <laughs> but don't talk to the wall. Wait until that little gate of attention opens. These things must be perceived before you open your mouth, before you decide to do something. Find the balance between the minds before. In your question, it is implied that you are paying way more attention to that person than the reverse. So you pay a lot of attention, but the other doesn't, rejects. Okay, so how about balancing it out? You also don't pay attention so much. We call that give the person some space. And when that balance is there, the other breathes a little more freely. Even if it's wrapped up all in emotional reactions, still you gave that freedom to that person. And when you feel that that balance is there, use your best clarity to actually start something based on this balance. And if the balance is broken, restore it before you go on. So before you manifest anything with speech, with feelings, with actions, Find that clarity, find that balance. We call that the middle way. Last question. What happens uh, when anger in uh, adolescence uh, ages, 12, 14, 16, 18, uh, continues to ages 20, 22, 24, 28? More training and necessary. <laughs> how, uh, as a mother and as a, as a a person who, who trains in yoga should react to this type of anger that continues to, from adolescence to adulthood without changing. Uh, find the necessary and right environment for this energy to manifest. So if you take anger out of context, it becomes destructive. I give you a non-angry example. It's a beautiful big space. Huh? Many people fit in there. You do yoga here. At the airport, you have also a big space and many people fit in there, but you don't do yoga there. <laughs> people with very interesting hats and uniform would come and they would gently ask you not to do that because it's not the right place for that. Same thing with your children. Find the necessary and correct place where this anger, which is out of place, can translate into the correct energy. And there are many places where they use lots of power from martial arts to military to many, many places where you can take the anger out, but keep the power. Important. So find the environment where they can connect to other people with the same or similar karma. And then they can do this to each other. This is really interesting, okay? <laughs> fighting, very good. They, they learn correct fighting. And listen to their experience, not your own idea. Your own idea will not work, you know? Their experience will tell you, okay, is this the right place, the right club, the right environment, the right team, the right activity? One day they come home super tired and happy. Oh, mom, give me something to eat. Poof, they fall asleep. <laughs> Done. Okay? No more anger. Finished. So I hope all of us will find the right situation, the right relationship, and the right action for our karma. Attain flexible and clear mind. Get rid of all our illusions come back to reality, to this clear moment, wake up and save all beings from suffering. And these beings include yourself. Don't forget. Thank you very much. <laughs>